The Return of Imre by Rudyard Kipling The doors were wide, the story saith. Out of the night came the patient wraith. He might not speak, and he could not stir, a hair of the baron's miniver. Speechless and strengthless, a shadow thin, he roved the castle to seek his kin. And oh, t'was a piteous thing to see, the dumb ghost follow his enemy. The Baron Imre achieved the impossible. Without warning, for no conceivable motive in his youth, at the threshold of his career, he chose to disappear from the world, which is to say, the little Indian station where he lived. Upon a day he was alive, well, happy, and in great evidence among the billiard tables at his club. Upon a morning he was not, and no manner of search could make sure where he might be. He had stepped out of his place. He had not appeared at his office at the proper time, and his dog-cart was not upon the public roads. For these reasons, and because he was hampering, in a microscopical degree, the administration of the Indian Empire, that empire paused for one microscopical moment to make inquiry into the fate of Imre. Ponds were dragged, wells were plumbed, telegrams were dispatched down the lines of railways and to the nearest seaport town, twelve hundred miles away. But Imre was not at the end of the drag ropes, nor the telegraph wires. He was gone, and his place knew him no more. Then the work of the great Indian Empire swept forward, because it could not be delayed, and Imre, from being a man, became a mystery, such a thing as men talk over at their tables in the club for a month, and then forget utterly. His guns, horses, and carts were sold to the highest bidder. His superior officer wrote an altogether absurd letter to his mother, saying that Imre had unaccountably disappeared, and his bungalow stood empty. After three or four months of the scorching hot weather had gone by, my friend Strickland of the police saw fit to rent the bungalow from the native landlord. This was before he was engaged to Miss Eugle, an affair which has been described in another place, and while he was pursuing his investigations into native life. His own life was sufficiently peculiar, and men complained of his manners and customs. There was always food in his house, but there were no regular times for meals. He ate, standing up and walking about, whatever he might find at the sideboard, and this is not good for human beings. His domestic equipment was limited to six rifles, three shotguns, five saddles, and a collection of stiff-jointed mashir rods, bigger and stronger than the largest salmon rods. These occupied one half of his bungalow, and the other half was given up to Strickland and his dog Tietien, an enormous ramper slut who devoured daily the rations of two men. She spoke to Strickland in a language of her own, and whenever, walking abroad, she saw things calculated to destroy the peace of Her Majesty the Queen Empress, she returned to her master and laid information. Strickland would take steps at once, and the end of his labours was trouble and fine and imprisonment for other people. The natives believed that Tietien was a familiar spirit, and treated her with the great reverence that is born of hate and fear. One room in the bungalow was set apart for her special use. She owned a bedstead, a blanket, and a drinking trough, and if anyone came into Strickland's room at night, her custom was to knock down the invader and give tongue till someone came with a light. Strickland owes his life to her when he was on the frontier, in search of a local murderer, who came in the grey dawn to send Strickland much farther than the Andaman Islands. Tietien caught the man as he was crawling into Strickland's tent with a dagger between his teeth, and after his record of iniquity was established in the eyes of the law, he was hanged. From that date, Tietien wore a collar of rough silver and employed a monogram on her night blanket, and the blanket was of double-woven cashmere cloth for she was a delicate dog. Under no circumstances would she be separated from Strickland, and once, when he was ill with fever, made great trouble for the doctors, because she did not know how to help her master and would not allow another creature to attempt aid. Makarnacht, of the Indian Medical Service, beat her over her head with a gun-butt before she could understand that she must give room for those who could give quinine. A short time after Strickland had taken Imray's bungalow, my business took me through that station, and naturally, the club quarters being full, I quartered myself upon Strickland. It was a desirable bungalow, eight-roomed and heavily thatched against any chance of leakage from rain. 
Under the pitch of the roof ran a ceiling cloth which looked just as neat as a whitewashed ceiling. The landlord had repainted it when Strickland took the bungalow. Unless you knew how Indian bungalows were built, you would never have suspected that above the cloth lay the dark three-cornered cavern of the roof, where the beams and the underside of the thatch harbored all manner of rats, bats, ants, and foul things. Tietjens met me in the veranda with a bay like the boom of the bell of St. Paul's, putting her paws on my shoulder to show me she was glad to see me. Strickland had contrived to claw together a sort of meal which he called lunch, and immediately after it was finished went out about his business. I was left alone with Tietjens and my own affairs. The heat of the summer had broken up and turned to the warm damp of the rains. There was no motion in the heated air, but the rain fell like ramrods on the earth, and flung up a blue mist when it splashed back. The bamboos and the custard apples, the poinsettias and the mango trees in the garden, stood still while the warm water lashed through them, and the frogs began to sing among the aloe hedges. A little before the light failed, and when the rain was at its worst, I sat in the back veranda and heard the water roar from the eaves, and scratched myself because I was covered with a thing called prickly heat. Tietjens came out with me and put her head in my lap and was very sorrowful, so I gave her biscuits when tea was ready, and I took tea in the back veranda on account of the little coolness found there. The rooms of the house were dark behind me. I could smell Strickland's saddlery and the oil on his guns, and I had no desire to sit among these things. My own servant came to me in the twilight, the muslin of his clothes clinging tightly to his drenched body, and told me that a gentleman had called and wished to see someone. Very much against my will, but only because of the darkness of the rooms, I went into the naked drawing-room, telling my man to bring the lights. There might or might not have been a caller waiting. It seemed to me that I saw a figure by one of the windows, but when the lights came there was nothing save the spikes of the rain without, and the smell of the drinking earth in my nostrils. I explained to my servant that he was no wiser than he ought to be, and went back to the veranda to talk to Tietjens. She had gone out into the wet, and I could hardly coax her back to me even with biscuits with sugar tops. Strickland came home, dripping wet, just before dinner, and the first thing he said was, "'Has anyone called?' I explained with apologies that my servant had summoned me into the drawing-room on a false alarm, or that some loafer had tried to call on Strickland, and thinking better of it had fled after giving his name. Strickland ordered dinner without comment, and since it was a real dinner with a white tablecloth attached, we sat down. At nine o'clock, Strickland wanted to go to bed, and I was tired too. Tietjens, who had been lying underneath the table, rose up and swung into the least exposed veranda as soon as her master moved to his own room, which was next to the stately chamber set apart for Tietjens. If a mere wife had wished to sleep out of doors in that pelting rain, it would not have mattered, but Tietjens was a dog, and therefore the better animal. I looked at Strickland, expecting to see him flay her with a whip. He smiled queerly, as a man would smile after telling some unpleasant domestic tragedy. "'She has done this ever since I moved in here,' said he. "'Let her go.' The dog was Strickland's dog, so I said nothing, but I felt all that Strickland felt, in being thus made light of. Tietjens encamped outside my bedroom window, and storm after storm came up, thundered on the thatch, and died away. The lightning spattered the sky, as a thrown egg spatters a barn door, but the light was pale blue, not yellow, and, looking through my split bamboo blinds, I could see the great dog standing, not sleeping in the veranda, the hackles a lift on her back, and her feet anchored as tensely as the drawn wire rope of a suspension bridge. In the very short pauses of the thunder I tried to sleep, but it seemed so someone wanted me very urgently. He, whoever he was, was trying to call me by name, but his voice was no more than a husky whisper. The thunder ceased, and Tietjens went into the garden and howled at the low moon. Somebody tried to open my door, walked about and about through the house, and stood breathing heavily in the verandas, and just when I was falling asleep I fancied that I heard a wild hammering and clamoring above my head or on the door. I ran into Strickland's room and asked him whether he was ill and had been calling for me. He was lying on his bed half-dressed, a pipe in his mouth. "'I thought you'd come,' he said. "'Have I been walking around the house recently?' 
I explained that he had been tramping in the dining room and the smoking room and two or three other places, and he laughed and told me to go back to bed. I went back to bed and slept till the morning, but through all my mixed dreams I was sure I was doing someone an injustice in not attending to his wants. What those wants were I could not tell, but a fluttering, whispering, bolt-fumbling, lurking, loitering someone was reproaching me for my slackness, and half awake I heard the howling of Tietjens in the garden and the threshing of the rain. I lived in that house for two days. Strickland went to his office daily, leaving me alone for eight rotten hours with Tietjens for my only companion. As long as the full light lasted I was comfortable, and so was Tietjens, but in the twilight she and I moved into the back veranda and cuddled each other for company. We were alone in the house, but none the less it was much too fully occupied by a tenant with whom I did not wish to interfere. I never saw him, but I could see the curtains between the rooms quivering where he had just passed through. I could hear the chairs creaking as the bamboos sprung under a weight that had just quitted them, and I could feel when I went to get a book from the dining room that somebody was waiting in the shadows of the front veranda till I should have gone away. Chechens made the twilight more interesting by glaring into the darkened rooms with every hair erect, and following the motions of something that I could not see. She never entered the rooms, but her eyes moved interestedly. That was quite sufficient. Only when my servant came to trim the lamps and make all light and habitable would she come in with me and spend her time sitting on her haunches, watching an invisible extra man as he moved about behind my shoulder. Dogs are cheerful companions. I explained to Strickland, gently as might be, that I would go over to the club and find for myself quarters there. I admired his hospitality, was pleased with his guns and rods, but I did not much care for his house and its atmosphere. He heard me out to the end, and then smiled very wearily, but without contempt, for he is a man who understands things. Stay on, he said, and see what this thing means. All you have talked about I have known since I took the bungalow. Stay on and wait. Tietjens has left me. Are you going too? I had seen him through one little affair, connected with a heathen idol, that had brought me to the doors of a lunatic asylum, and I had no desire to help him through further experiences. He was a man to whom unpleasantnesses arrived as do dinners to ordinary people. Therefore I explained more clearly than ever that I liked him immensely and would be happy to see him in the daytime, but that I did not care to sleep under his roof. This was after dinner, when Tietjens has gone out to lie in the veranda. "'Pon my soul, I don't wonder,' said Strickland, with his eyes on the ceiling cloth. "'Look at that!' The tails of two brown snakes were hanging between the cloth and the cornice of the wall. They threw long shadows in the lamplight. "'If you are afraid of snakes, of course,' said Strickland. "'I hate and fear snakes, because if you look into the eyes of any snake, you will see that it knows all and more of the mystery of man's fall, and that it feels all the contempt that the devil felt when Adam was evicted from Eden. Besides which, its bite is generally fatal, and it twists up trouser legs. "'You ought to get your thatch overhauled,' I said. "'Give me a masseer rod, and we'll poke em down.' "'They'll hide among the roof beams,' said Strickland. "'I can't stand snakes overhead. "'I'm going up into the roof. "'If I shake em down, stand by with a cleaning rod and break their backs.' "'I was not anxious to assist Strickland in his work, "'but I took the cleaning rod and waited in the dining room "'while Strickland brought a gardener's ladder from the veranda "'and set it against the side of the room. "'The snake tails drew themselves up and disappeared.' We could hear the dry, rushing scuttle of long bodies running over the baggy ceiling cloth. Strickland took a lamp with him, while I tried to make clear to him the danger of hunting roof snakes between a ceiling cloth and a thatch, apart from the deterioration of property caused by ripping out ceiling cloths. "'Nonsense!' said Strickland. "'They're sure to hide near the walls by the cloth. The bricks are too cold for them, and the heat of the room is just what they like.' He put his hand to the corner of the stuff and ripped it from the cornice. It gave with a great sound of tearing, and Strickland put his head through the opening into the dark of the angle of the roof beams. I set my teeth and lifted the rod, for I had not the least knowledge of what might descend. Hmm, said Strickland, and his voice rolled and jumbled in the roof. There's room for another set of rooms up here, and by Jove, someone is occupying them. Snakes, I said from below. No, it's a buffalo. 
Hand me up the la two last joints of a masseur rod, and I'll prod it. It's lying on the main roof beam. I handed up the rod. What a nest for owls and serpents! No wonder the snakes live here, said Strickland, climbing farther onto the roof. I could see his elbow thrusting with the rod. Come out of that, whoever you are. Heads below there, it's falling! I saw the ceiling cloth nearly in the centre of the room, bag with a shape that was pressing it downwards and downwards toward the lighted lamp on the table. I snatched the lamp out of danger and stood back. Then the cloth ripped out from the walls, tore, split, swayed, and shot down upon the table, something that I dared not look at, till Strickland had slid down the ladder and was standing by my side. He did not say much, being a man of few words, but he picked up the loose end of the tablecloth and threw it over the remnants on the table. "'It strikes me,' he said, putting down the lamp. "'Our friend Imre has come back.' "'Oh, you would, would you?' There was a movement under the cloth, and a little snake wriggled out to be back-broken by the butt of the masseur rod. I was sufficiently sick to make no remarks worth recording. Strickland meditated and helped himself to drinks. The arrangement under the cloth made no more signs of life. "'Is it Imre?' I said. Strickland turned back to the cloth for a moment and looked. "'It is Imre,' he said, and his throat is cut from ear to ear. Then we spoke both together and to ourselves. "'That's why he whispered about the house.' Tietjens in the garden began to bay furiously. A little later her great nose heaved open the dining-room door. She snuffed and was still. The tattered ceiling cloth hung down almost to the level of the table, and there was hardly room to move away from the discovery. Tietens came in and sat down, her teeth bared under her lip and her forepaws planted. She looked at Strickland. "'It's a bad business, old lady,' said he. "'Men don't climb up into the roofs of their bungalows to die, and they don't fasten up the ceiling cloth behind them. Let's think it out.' "'Let's think it out somewhere else,' I said. "'Excellent idea. Turn the lamps out. We'll get into my room.' I did not turn the lamps out. I went into Strickland's room first, and allowed him to make the darkness. Then he followed me, and we lit tobacco and thought. Strickland thought. I smoked furiously, because I was afraid. "'Imre is back,' said Strickland. "'The question is, who killed Imre?' "'Don't talk.' I have a notion of my own. When I took this bungalow, I took over most of Imre's servants. Imre was guileless and inoffensive, wasn't he? I agreed, though the heap under the cloth had looked neither one thing nor the other. If I call in all the servants, they will stand fast in a crowd and lie like Aryans. What do you suggest? Call them in one by one, I said. They'll run away and give the news to all their fellows, said Strickland. We must segregate them. "'Do you suppose your servant knows anything about it?' Oh, "'He may, for aught I know, but I don't think it's likely. "'He has only been here two or three days,' I answered. "'What's your notion?' "'I can't quite tell. "'How the dickens did the man get the wrong side of the ceiling cloth?' "'There was a heavy coughing outside Strickland's bedroom door. "'This showed that Badahur Khan, his body servant, "'had waked from sleep and wished to put Strickland to bed. "'Come in,' said Strickland.' It's a very warm night, isn't it? Bahadur Khan, a great green turban six foot Mohammedan, said that it was a very warm night, but that there was more rain pending, which, by his honour's favour, would bring relief to the country. It will be so, if God pleases, said Strickland, tugging off his boots. It is in my mind, Bahadur Khan, that I have worked thee remorselessly for many days, ever since that time when thou first camest into my service. What time was that? Has the heaven-born forgotten? It was when Imre Sahib went secretly to Europe without warning given, and I, even I, came into the honoured service of the protector of the poor. And Imre Sahib went to Europe? It is so said among those who were his servants. And thou wilt take service with him when he returns? Assuredly, Sahib, he was a good master and cherished his dependents. That is true. I am very tired, but I go buck-shooting to-morrow. Give me the little sharp rifle that I use for black buck. It is in the case yonder. The man stooped over the case, handed barrels, stock, and foreign to Strickland, who fitted all together, yawning dolefully. 
Then he reached down to the gun case, took a solid-drawn cartridge, and slipped it into the breech of the 360 Express. "'And Imre Sahib has gone to Europe secretly. That is very strange, Bahadur Khan, is it not? What do I know of the ways of the white man, heaven-born? Very little, truly, but thou shalt know more anon. It has reached me that Imre Sahib has returned from his so long journeyings, and that even now he lies in the next room, waiting his servant. Sahib! The lamplight slid along the barrels of the rifle as they leveled themselves at Bahadur Khan's broad breast. Go and look, said Strickland. Take a lamp. Thy master is tired, and he waits thee. Go. The man picked up a lamp and went into the dining room, Strickland following, and almost pushing him with the muzzle of the rifle. He looked for a moment at the black depths behind the ceiling cloth, at the writhing snake underfoot, and last a grey glaze settling on his face, at the thing under the tablecloth. "'Hast thou seen?' said Strickland after a pause. "'I have seen. I am clay in the white man's hands. What does the presence do? Hang thee within the month. What else? For killing him? Nay, Sahib, consider. Walking among us, his servants, he cast his eyes upon my child, who was four years old. Him he bewitched, and in ten days he died of the fever, my child. What said Emre Sahib? He said he was a handsome child, and patted him on the head, wherefore my child died. Wherefore I killed Imre Sahib in the twilight, when he had come back from office and was sleeping. Wherefore I dragged him up into the roof beams and made all fast behind him. The heaven-born knows all things. I am the servant of the heaven-born. Strickland looked at me above the rifle, and said in the vernacular, Thou art witness to this saying? He has killed. Bahadur Khan stood ashen grey in the light of the one lamp. The need for justification came upon him very swiftly. I am trapped, he said, but the offence was that man's. He cast an evil eye upon my child, and I killed and hid him. Only such as are served by devils. He glared at Tietjens, couched stolidly before him. Only such could know what I did. It was clever, but thou shouldst have lashed him to the beam with a rope. Now thou thyself wilt hang by a rope. Orderly! A drowsy policeman answered Strickland's call. He was followed by another, and Tietjens sat wondrous still. "'Take him to the police station,' said Strickland. "'There is a case to ward.' "'Do I hang, then?' said Bahadur Khan, making no attempt to escape, and keeping his eyes on the ground. "'If the sun shines or the water runs, yes,' said Strickland. Bahadur Khan stepped back one long pace, quivered, and stood still. The two policemen waited further orders. "'Go!' said Strickland. "'Nay, but I go very swiftly,' said Bahadur Khan. "'Look, I am even now a dead man.' He lifted his foot, and to the little toe there clung the head of the half-killed snake, firm fixed in the agony of death. "'I come of land-holding stock,' said Bahadur Khan, rocking where he stood. "'It were a disgrace to me to go to the public scaffold. Therefore I take this way.' Be it remember that the sahib's shirts are correctly enumerated, and that there is an extra piece of soap in his wash-basin. My child was bewitched, and I slew the wizard. Why should you seek to slay me with the rope? My honour is saved, and... and... I die. At the end of an hour he died, as they die who are bitten by the little brown karit, and the policemen bore him and the thing under the tablecloth to their appointed places. All were needed to make clear the disappearance of Imre. This, said Strickland, very calmly as he climbed into bed, is called the nineteenth century. Did you hear what that man said? I heard, I answered. Imre made a mistake. Simply and solely through not knowing the nature of the Oriental, and the coincidence of a little seasonal fever. Bahadur Khan had been with him for four years. I shuddered. My own servant had been with me for exactly that length of time. When I went over to my own room, I found my man waiting, impassive as the copper head on a penny, to pull off my boots. "'What has befallen Bahadur Khan?' said I. "'He was bitten by a snake and died. The rest the sahib knows,' was the answer. "'And how much of this matter hast thou known?' 
as much as might be gathered from one coming in in the twilight to seek satisfaction. Gently, Sahib, let me pull off those boots. I had just settled to the sleep of exhaustion when I heard Strickland shouting from his side of the house, Chechens has come back to her place! And so she had. The great deer hound was couched statelily on her own bedstead, on her own blanket, while in the next room the idle empty ceiling cloth waggled as it trailed on the table. End of The Return of Imre by Rudyard Kipling Since I Died by Elizabeth Stuart Phelps How very still you sit, if the shadow of an eyelash stirred upon your cheek, if that grey line about your mouth should snap its tension at this quivering end, if the pallor of your profile warmed a little, if that tiny muscle on your forehead, just at the left eyebrow's curve, should start and twitch, if you would but grow a trifle restless, sitting there beneath my steady gaze, if you moved a finger of your folded hands, if you should turn and look behind your chair, or lift your face, half lingering and half longing, half loving and half loath, to ponder on the annoyed and thwarted cry which the wind is making, where I stand, between it and yourself, against the half-closed window. Ah, there. You sigh and stir, I think. You lift your head. The little muscle is a captive still. The line about your mouth is tense and hard. The deepening hollow in your cheek has no warmer tint, I see, than the great Doric column which the moonlight builds against the wall. I lean against it. I hold out my arms. You lift your head and look me in the eye. If a shudder crept across your figure, if your arms, laid out upon the table, leapt but once above your head, if you named my name, if you held your breath with terror, or sobbed aloud for love, or sprang, or cried. But you only lift your head and look me in the eye. If I dared step near, or nearer, if it were permitted that I should cross the current of your living breath, if it were willed that I should leap the leap of human blood within your veins, if I should touch your hands, your cheeks, your lips, if I dropped an arm as lightly as a snowflake round your shoulder. The fear which no heart has fathomed, the fate which no fancy has faced, the riddle which no soul has read, steps between your substance and my soul. I drop my arms. I sink into the heart of the pillared light upon the wall. I will not wonder what would happen if my outlines defined upon it to your view. I will not think of that which could be, would be, if I struck across your still-set vision face to face. Ah, me, how still she sits. With what a fixed, incurious stare she looks me in the eye. The wind, now that I stand no longer between it and yourself, comes enviously in. It lifts the curtain and whirls about the room. It bruises the surface of the great pearled pillar where I lean. I am caught within it. Speech and language struggle over me. Mute articulations fill the air. Tears and laughter, and the sounding of soft lips, and the falling of low cries possess me. Will she listen? Will she bend her head? Will her lips part in recognition? Is there an alphabet between us, or have the winds of night a vocabulary to lift before her holden eyes? We sat many times together and talked of this. Do you remember, dear? You held my hand. Tears that I could not see fell on it. We sat by the great hall window upstairs, where the maple shadow goes to sleep, face down, across the floor upon a lighted night. The old green curtain waved its hands upon us like a mesmerist, I thought. Like a priest, you said. 
When we are parted, you shall go, you said, and when I shook my head, you smiled. You always smiled when you said that, but you said it always quite the same. I think I hardly understood you then, now that I hold your eyes in mine, and you see me not. Now when I stretch my hand, and you touch me not. Now that I cry your name, and you hear it not. I comprehend you, tender one. A wisdom not of earth was in your words. To live is dying. I will die. To die is life. And you shall live. Now when the fever turned, I thought of this. That must have been, ah, uh, how long ago? I miss the conception of that for which how long stands index. Yet I perfectly remember that I perfectly understood it to be at three o'clock on a rainy Sunday morning that I died. Your little watch stood in its case of olive wood upon the table, and drops were on the window. I noticed both, though you did not know it. I see the watch now in your pocket. I cannot tell if the hands move or only pulsate like a heart throb to and fro. They stand and point, mute gold fingers, paralyzed and pleading, forever at the hour of three. At this I wonder. When first you said I was sinking fast, the words sounded as old and familiar as a nursery tale. I heard you in the hall. The doctor had just left, and you went to mother and took her face in your two arms and laid your hand across her mouth as if it were she who had spoken. She cried out and threw up her thin old hands, but you stood as still as eternity. Then I thought, again, is it she who dies? I shall live. So often and so anxiously we have talked of this thing called death. Now that it is all over between us, I cannot understand why it's such a source of distress. It bewilders me. I am often bewildered here. Things and the fancies of things possess a relation which as yet is new and strange to me. Here is a mystery. Now in truth, it seems a simple matter for me to tell you how it has been with me since your lips last touched me and your arms held me to the vanishing air. Oh, drawn pale lips, nerveless dropping arms, I told you I would come. Did ever promise fail I spoke to you? Come and show me death, you said. I have come to show you death. I could show you the fairest sight and sweetest that ever blessed your eyes. Why, look, is it not fair? Am I terrible? Do you shrink or shiver? Would you turn from me or hide your strained, expectant face? Would she? Does she? Will she? Ah, how the room widened. I could tell you that. It grew great and luminous day by day. At night the walls throbbed, lights of rose ran round them, and blue fire and a tracery as of the shadows of little leaves. As the walls expanded, the air fled, but I tried to tell you how little pain I knew or feared. Your haggard face bent over me. I could not speak. When I would, I struggled, and you said, she suffers. Dear, it was so very little. Listen till I tell you how that night came on. The sun fell and the dew slid down. It seemed to me that it slid into my heart, but still I felt no pain. Where the walls pulsed and receded, the hills came in. Where the old bureau stood above the glass, I saw a single mountain with a face of fire and purple hair. I tried to tell you this, but you said, she wanders. I laughed in my heart at that, for it was such a blessed wandering. As the night locked the sun below the mountain's solemn watching face, the gates of space were lifted up before me. 
the everlasting doors of matter swung for me upon their rusty hinges, and the king of glories entered in and out. All the kingdoms of the earth, and the power of them beckoned to me, across the mist my failing senses made, runes and roses, and the brows of Jura and the singing of the Rhine. A shaft of red light on the Sphinx's smile, and caravans in sandstorms, and an icy wind at sea, and gold a dream in minds that no man knew, and mothers sitting at their doors in valleys, singing babes to sleep, and women in dank cellars selling souls for bread, and the whir of wheels in giant factories, and a single prayer somewhere in a den of death. I could not find it, though I searched. And the smoke of battle, and broken music, and a sense of lilies alone beside a stream at the rising of the sun. And at last, your face, dear, all alone. I discovered then that the walls and roof of the room had vanished quite. The night wind blew in. The maple in the yard almost brushed my cheek. Stars were about me, and I thought the rain had stopped, yet seemed to hear it up on the seeming of a window which I could not find. One thing only hung between me and immensity. It was your single, awful, haggard face. I looked my last into your eyes. Stronger than death they held and claimed my soul. I feebly raised my hand to find your own. More cruel than the grave your wild grasp chained me. Then I struggled, and you cried out, and your face slipped, and I stood free. I stood upon the floor beside the bed. That which had been I lay there at rest, but terrible before me. You hid your face, and I saw you slide upon your knees. I laid my hand upon your head. You did not stir. I spoke to you. Dear, look around a minute. But you knelt quite still. I walked to and fro about the room, and meeting my mother touched her on the elbow. She only said, She's gone, and sobbed aloud. I have not gone! I cried, but she sat sobbing on. The walls of the room had settled now, and the ceiling stood in its solid place. The window was shut, but the door stood open. Suddenly I was restless, and I ran. I brushed you in hurrying by, and hit the little light stand where the tumbler stood. I looked to see if it would fall, but it only shivered as if a breath of wind had struck it once. But I was restless, and I ran. In the hall I met the doctor. This amused me, and I stopped to think it over. Ah, doctor, said I, you need not trouble yourself to go up. I'm quite well tonight, you see. But he made me no answer. He gave me no glance. He hung up his hat and laid his hand upon the banister against which I leaned and went ponderously up. It was not until he had nearly reached the landing that it occurred to me, still leaning on the banisters, that his heavy arm must have swept against and through me, where I stood against the oaken mouldings which he grasped. I saw his feet fall on the stairs above me, but they made no sound which reached my ear. "'You will not disturb me now with your big boots, sir,' said I, nodding. "'Never fear.' But he disappeared from sight above me and still I heard no sound. Now the doctor had left the front door unlatched. As I touched it, it blew open wide and solemnly. I passed out and down the steps. I could see that it was chilly, yet I felt no chill. Frost was on the grass, and in the east a pallid streak, like the cheek of one who had watched all night. The flowers in the little square plots hung their heads and drew their shoulders up, there was a lonely, late lily which I broke and gathered to my heart, where I breathed upon it, and it warmed and looked me kindly in the eye. This, I remember, gave me pleasure. I wandered in and out about the garden in the scattering rain, 
my feet left no trace upon the dripping grass. And I saw with interest that the garment which I wore gathered no moisture and no cold. I sat musing for a while upon the piazza, in the garden chair, not caring to go in. It was so many months since I had felt able to sit upon the piazza in the open air. By and by, I thought, I would go in and upstairs to see you once again. The curtains were drawn from the parlor windows, and I passed, and repassed, looking in. All this while the cheek of the east was waning, and the air gathering faint heats and lights about me. I remembered presently the old arbor at the garden foot, where before I was sick we sat so much together, and thinking she will be surprised to know that I have been down alone. I was restless, and I ran again. I meant to come back and see you, dear, once more. I saw the lights in the room where I had lain sick overhead, and your shadow on the curtain, and I blessed it with all the love of life and death as I bounded by. The air was thick with sweetness from the dying flowers. The birds woke, and the zenith lighted, and the leap of health was in my limbs. The old arbor held out its soft arms to me, but I was restless, and I ran. The field opened before me, and meadows with broad blossoms, and a river flashed before me like a scimitar, and woods interlocked their hands to stay me. But being restless, on I ran. The house dwindled behind me, and the light in my sick room, and your shadow on the curtain. But yet I was restless, and I ran. In the twinkling of an eye I fell into a solitary place. Sand and rocks were in it, and a falling wind. I paused and knelt upon the sand, and mused a little in this place. I mused of you, and life and death, and love and agony. But these had departed from me, as dim and distant as the fainting wind. A sense of solemn expectation filled the air. A tremor and a trouble wrapped my soul. I must be dead, I said aloud. I had no sooner spoken than I learned that I was not alone. The sun had risen, and on a ledge of ancient rock, weather-stained in red, there had fallen over against me the outline of a presence lifted up against the sky. And turning suddenly, I saw. Lawful to utter, but utterance has fled. Lawful to utter, but a greater than law restrains me. Am I blotted from your desolate fixed eyes, lips that my mortal lips have pressed? Can you not quiver when I cry? Soul that my eternal soul has loved, can you stand enveloped in my presence and not spring like a fountain to me? Would you not know how it has been with me since your perishable eyes beheld my perished face? What my eyes have seen or my ears have heard, or my heart conceived without you? If I have missed or mourned for you, if I have watched or longed for you, marked your solitary days and sleepless nights and tearless eyes and monotonous slow echo of my unanswered name, would you not know? Alas, would she? Would she not? My soul misgives me with a matchless solitary fear. I am called, and I slip from her. I am beckoned, and lose her. Her face dims, and her folded lonely hands fade from my sight. Time to tell her a guarded thing. Time to whisper a treasured word. A moment to tell her that death is dumb, for life is deaf. A moment to tell her. End of Since I Died by Elizabeth Stuart Phelps Clairvoyance by Algernon Blackwood In the darkest corner, where the firelight could not reach him, he sat listening to the stories. His young hostess occupied the corner on the other side. She was also screened by shadows. 
and between them stretched the horseshoe of eager, frightened faces that seemed all eyes. Behind yawned the blackness of the big room, running as it were without a break into the night. Someone crossed on tiptoe and drew a blind up with a rattle, and at the sound all started. Through the window, opened at the top, came a rustle of the poplar leaves that stirred like footsteps in the wind. "'There's a strange man walking past the shrubberies,' whispered a nervous girl. "'I saw him crouch and hide. I saw his eyes!' "'Nonsense!' came sharply from a male member of the group. "'It's far too dark to see. You heard the wind.' For mist had risen from the river just below the lawn, pressing close against the windows of the old house like a soft gray hand, and through it the stir of leaves was faintly audible. Then, while several called for lights, others remembered that hop pickers were still about in the lanes, and the tramps this autumn overbold and insolent. All, perhaps, wished secretly for the sun. Only the elderly man in the corner sat quiet and unmoved, contributing nothing. He had told no fearsome story. He had evaded, indeed, many openings expressly made for him, though fully aware that to his well-known interest in psychical things was partly due his presence in the weekend party. "'I never have experiences that way,' he said shortly when someone asked him point-blank for a tale. I have no unusual powers. There was perhaps the merest hint of contempt in his tone, but the hostess from her darkened corner quickly and tactfully covered his retreat. And he wondered, for he knew why she invited him. The haunted room, he was well aware, had been specially allotted to him. And then, most opportunely, the door opened noisily and the host came in. He sniffed at the darkness, rang at once for lamps, puffed at his big curved pipe, and generally, by his mere presence, made the group feel rather foolish. Light streamed past him from the corridor. His white hair shone like silver, and with him came the atmosphere of common sense, of shooting, agriculture, motors, and the rest. Age entered at that door, and his young wife sprang up instantly to greet him as though his disapproval of this kind of entertainment might need humoring. It might have been the light, that witchery of half-lights from the fire in the corridor, or it may have been the abrupt entrance of the practical upon the soft imaginative that traced the outline with such pitiless sharp conviction. At any rate, the contrast, for those who had this inner clairvoyant sight all had been prating of so glibly, was unmistakably revealed. It was poignantly dramatic, pain somewhere in it, naked pain. For, as she paused a moment there beside him in the light, this childless wife of three years standing, picture of youth and beauty, there stood upon the threshold of that room the presence of a true ghost story. And most marvelously she changed. Her lineaments, her very figure, her whole presentment. Etched against the gloom, the delicate, unmarked face shone suddenly keen and anguished, and a rich maturity, deeper than any mere age, flushed all her little person with its secret grandeur. Lines started into being upon the pale skin of the girlish face, lines of pleading, pity, and love the daylight did not show, and with them an air of magic tenderness that betrayed though for a second only, the full, soft glory of a motherhood denied, yet somehow mysteriously enjoyed. About her slenderness rose all the deep-bosomed sweetness of maternity, a potential mother of the world, and a mother, though she might know no dear fulfillment, who yet yearned to sweep into her immense embrace all the little helpless things that ever lived. Light, like emotion, can play strangest tricks. The change pressed almost upon the edge of revelation. Yet, when a moment later lamps were brought, it is doubtful if any but the silent guest who had told no marvelous tale, knew no psychical experience, and disclaimed the smallest clairvoyant faculty, had received and registered the vivid, poignant picture. 
For an instant it had flashed there, mercilessly clear for all to see who were not blind to subtle spiritual wonder thick with pain. And it was not so much mere picture of youth and age ill-matched, as of youth that yearned with the oldest craving in the world, and of age that had slipped beyond the power of sympathetically divining it. It passed, and all was as before. The husband laughed with genial good nature, not one whit annoyed. They've been frightening you with stories, child, he said in his jolly way, and put a protective arm about her. Haven't they now? Tell me the truth. Much better, he added, have joined me instead at billiards, or for a game of patience, eh? She looked up shyly into his face, and he kissed her on the forehead. Perhaps they have. A little, dear, she said. But now that you've come, I feel all right again. Another night of this, he added in a graver tone, and you'd be at your old trick of putting guests to sleep in the haunted room. I was right after all, you see, to make it out of bounds. He glanced fondly, paternally, down upon her. Then he went over and poked the fire into a blaze. Someone struck up a waltz on the piano, and couples danced. All trace of nervousness vanished, and the butler presently brought in the tray with drinks and biscuits, and slowly the group dispersed. Candles were lit. They passed down the passage into the big hall, talking in lowered voices of tomorrow's plans. The laughter died away as they went up the stairs to bed, the silent guest and the young wife lingering a moment over the embers. "'You have not, after all, then, put me in your haunted room?' he asked quietly. "'You mentioned, you remember, in your letter.' "'I admit,' she replied at once, her manner gracious beyond her years, her voice quite different, "'that I wanted you to sleep there. "'Someone, I mean, who really knows and is not merely curious. "'But, forgive my saying so, when I saw you,' she laughed very slowly." And when you told no marvelous story like the others, I somehow felt... But I never see anything, he put in hurriedly. You feel, though, she interrupted swiftly, the passionate tenderness in her voice but half suppressed. I can tell it from your... Others, then, he interrupted abruptly, almost bluntly. Have slept there? Sat up, rather? Not recently. My husband stopped it. She paused a second, then added, I had that room for a year when first we married. The other's anguished look flew back upon her little face like a shadow and was gone, while at the sight of it there rose in himself a sudden deep rush of wonderful amazement beckoning almost toward worship. He did not speak, for his voice would tremble. I had to give it up, she finished very low. Was it so terrible? After a pause, he ventured. She bowed her head. I had to change, she repeated softly. And since then, now, you see nothing, he asked. Her reply was singular. Because I will not, not because it's gone. He followed her in silence to the door, and as they passed along the passage, again that curious great pain of emptiness, of loneliness, of yearning rose upon him, as of a sea that never, never can swim beyond the shore to reach the flowers that it loves. "'Hurry up, child, or a ghost will catch you!' cried her husband, leaning over the banisters as the pair moved slowly up the stairs towards him. There was a moment's silence when they met, the guest took his lighted candle and went down the corridor. Good nights were said again. They moved away, she to her loneliness, he to his unhaunted room. And at his door he turned. At the far end of the passage, silhouetted against the candlelight, he watched them. The fine old man with his silvered hair and heavy shoulders, and the slim young wife, with that amazing air as of some great bountiful mother of the world for whom the years yet passed hungry and unharvested. They turned the corner, and he went in and closed his door. 
Sleep took him very quickly, and while the mist rose up and veiled the countryside, something else, veiled equally for all other sleepers in that house but two, drew on towards its climax. Some hours later he awoke. The world was still, and it seemed the whole house listened, for with that clear vision which some bring out of sleep, he remembered that there had been no direct denial, and of a sudden realized that this big, gaunt chamber where he lay was, after all, the haunted room. For him, however, the entire world, not merely separate rooms in it, was ever haunted, and he knew no terror to find the space about him charged with thronging life quite other than his own. He rose and lit the candle, crossed over to the window where the mist shone gray, knowing that no barriers of walls or door or ceiling could keep out this host of presences that poured so thickly everywhere about him. It was like a wall of being, with peering eyes, small hands stretched out, a thousand pattering wee feet, and tiny voices crying in a chorus very faintly and beseeching. The haunted room! Was it not rather a temple vestibule, prepared and sanctified by yearning rites few men might ever guess for all the childless women of the world? How could she know that he would understand, this woman he had seen but twice in all his life? And how entrust to him so great a mystery that was her secret? Had she so easily divined in him a similar yearning to which, long years ago, death had denied fulfillment? Was she clairvoyant in the true sense, and did all faces bear on them so legibly this great map that sorrow traced? And then, with awful suddenness, mere feelings dipped away, and something concrete happened. The handle of the door had faintly rattled. He turned. The round brass knob was slowly moving. And first, at the sight, something of common fear did grip him, as though his heart had missed a beat. But on the instant he heard the voice of his own mother, now long beyond the stars, calling to him to go softly, yet with speed. He watched a moment the feeble efforts to undo the door, yet never afterwards could swear that he saw actual movement, for something in him, tragic as blindness, rose through a mist of tears and darkened vision utterly. He went towards the door. He took the handle very gently, and very softly then he opened it. Beyond was darkness. He saw the empty passage, the edge of the banisters where the great hall yawned below, and, dimly, the outline of the alpine photograph and the stuffed deer's head upon the wall. And then he dropped upon his knees and opened wide his arms to something that came in upon uncertain, viewless feet. All the young winds and flowers and dews of dawn passed with it, filling him to the brim, covering closely his breast and eyes and lips. There clung to him all the small beginnings of life that cannot stand alone, the little helpless hands and arms that have no confidence. And when the wealth of tears and love that flooded his heart seemed to break upon the frontiers of some mysterious yet impossible fulfillment, he rose and went with curious small steps towards the window to taste the cooling, misty air of that other dark emptiness that waited so patiently there above the entire world. He drew the sash up. The air felt soft and tender, as though there were somewhere children in it, too, children of stars and flowers, of mists and wings and music, all that the universe contains, unborn and tiny. And when at length he turned again, the door was closed. The room was empty of any life but that which lay so wonderfully blessed within himself. And this, he felt, had marvelously increased and multiplied. Sleep then came back to him, and in the morning he left the house before the others were astir, pleading some overlooked engagement. For he had seen ghosts indeed, but yet no ghost that he could talk about with others round an open fire. End of Clairvoyance by Algernon Blackwood
A Haunted House by Virginia Woolf. Whatever hour you woke, there was a door shutting. From room to room they went hand in hand, lifting here, opening there, making sure. A ghostly couple. Here we left it, she said. And he added, Oh, but here too. It's upstairs, she murmured. And in the garden he whispered. Quietly, they said, or we shall wake them. But it wasn't that you woke us. Oh no, they're looking for it. They're drawing the curtain, one might say. And so read on a page or two. Now they've found it. One would be certain, stopping the pencil on the margin. And then, tired of reading, one might rise and see for oneself the house all empty, the door standing open, only the wood pigeons bubbling with content, and the hum of the threshing machine sounding from the farm. What did I come in here for? What did I want to find? My hands were empty. Perhaps it's upstairs, then. The apples were in the loft, and so down again in the garden still as ever. Only the book had slipped into the grass. But they had found it in the drawing room. Not that one could ever see them. The window panes reflected apples, reflected roses. All the leaves were green in the glass. If they moved in the drawing room, the apple only turned its yellow side. Yet the moment after, if the door was opened, spread about the floor, hung upon the walls, pendant from the ceiling. What? My hands were empty. The shadow of a thrush crossed the carpet. From the deepest wells of silence, the wood pigeon drew its bubble of sound. Safe, safe, safe. The pulse of the house beat softly. The treasure buried the room. The pulse stopped short. Oh, was that the buried treasure? A moment later, the light had faded. Out in the garden, then. But the trees spun darkness for a wandering beam of sun so fine, so rare, so coolly sunk. Beneath the surface, the beam I sought always burning behind the glass. Death was the glass. Death was between us coming to the woman first, hundreds of years ago leaving the house, sealing all the windows. The rooms were darkened. He left it, left her, went north, went east, saw the stars turned in the southern sky, sought the house, found it dropped beneath the downs. Safe, safe, safe. The pulse of the house beat gladly, the treasure yours. The wind roars up the avenue. Trees stoop and bend this way and that. Moonbeams splash and spill wildly in the rain. But the beam of the lamp falls straight from the window. The candle burns stiff and still, wandering through the house, opening the windows, whispering not to wake us. The ghostly couple seek their joy. Here we slept, she says. And he adds, kisses without number, waking in the morning, silver between the trees upstairs in the garden, when summer came in winter snow time. The doors go shutting far in the distance, gently knocking like the pulse of a heart. Nearer they come, cease at the doorway. The wind falls, the rain slides silver down the glass. Our eyes darken. We hear no steps beside us. We see no lady spread her ghostly cloak. His hands shield the lantern. Look, he breathes. Sound asleep. Love upon their lips. Stooping, holding their silver lamp above us. Long they look. And deeply. Long they pause. The wind drives straightly. The flame stoops slightly. Wild beams of moonlight cross both floor and wall, and, meeting, stain the faces bent, the faces pondering, the faces that search the sleepers and seek their hidden joy. Safe, 
safe, safe. The heart of the house beats proudly. Long years, he sighs. Again you found me. Here, she murmurs, sleeping in the garden reading, laughing, rolling apples in the loft. Here we left our treasure. Stooping, their light lifts the lids upon my eyes. Safe, safe, safe. Safe, safe, safe. The pulse of the house beats wildly. Waking, I cry, oh, is this your buried treasure? The light in the heart. End of A Haunted House by Virginia Woolf Letter to Sura by Pliny the Younger Our leisure furnishes me with the opportunity of learning from you, and you with that of instructing me. Accordingly, I particularly wish to know whether you think there exist such things as phantoms, possessing an appearance peculiar to themselves, and a certain supernatural power, or that mere empty delusions receive a shape from our fears. For my part, I am led to believe in their existence, especially by what I hear happen to Curtius Rufus. While still in humble circumstances and obscure, he was a hanger-on in the suite of the governor of Africa, while pacing the colonnade one afternoon, there appeared to him a female form of superhuman size and beauty. She informed the terrified man that she was Africa, and had come to foretell future events, for that he would go to Rome, would fill offices of state there, and would even return to that same province with the highest powers, and die in it. All which things were fulfilled." Moreover, as he touched at Carthage, and was disembarking from his ship, the same form is said to have presented itself to him on the shore. It is certain that, being seized with illness, and auguring the future from the past and misfortune from his previous prosperity, he himself abandoned all hope of life, though none of those about him despaired. Is not the following story again still more appalling and not less marvelous? I will relate it as it was received by me. There was at Athens a mansion, spacious and commodious, but of evil repute and dangerous to health. In the dead of night there was a noise as of iron, and, if you listened more closely, a clanking of chains was heard, first of all from a distance, and afterwards hard by. Presently a specter used to appear, an ancient man, sinking with emaciation and squalor, with a long beard and bristly hair, wearing shackles on his legs and fetters on his hands, and shaking them. Hence the inmates, by reason of their fears, passed miserable and horrible nights in sleeplessness. This want of sleep was followed by disease, and, their terrors increasing, by death, for in the daytime as well, Though the apparition had departed, yet a reminiscence of it flitted before their eyes, and their dread outlived its cause. The mansion was accordingly deserted, and, condemned to solitude, was entirely abandoned to the dreadful ghost. However, it was advertised, on the chance of someone, ignorant of the fearful curse attached to it, being willing to buy or rent it. Athenodorus, the philosopher, came to Athens and read the advertisement. When he had been informed of the terms, which were so low as to appear suspicious, he made inquiries and learned the whole of the particulars. Yet none the less on that account, nay, all the more readily did he rent the house. As evening began to draw on, he ordered a sofa to be set for himself in the front part of the house, and called for his notebooks, writing implements, and a light. The whole of his servants he dismissed to the interior apartments, and for himself applied his soul, eyes, and hands to composition, that his mind might not, from want of occupation, picture to itself the phantoms of which he had heard, or any empty terrors. At the commencement there was the universal silence of night. Soon the shaking of irons and the clanking of chains was heard, yet he never raised his eyes nor slackened his pen, but hardened his soul and deadened his ears by its help. The noise grew and approached, 
Now it seemed to be heard at the door, and next inside the door. He looked round, beheld and recognized the figure he had been told of. It was standing and signaling to him with its finger, as though inviting him. He, in reply, made a sign with his hand that it should wait a moment, and applied himself afresh to his tablets and pen. Upon this the figure kept rattling its chains over his head as he wrote. On looking round again, he saw it making the same signal as before, and without delay took up a light and followed it. It moved with a slow step, as though oppressed by its chains, and, after turning into the courtyard of the house, vanished suddenly and left his company. On being thus left to himself, he marked the spot with some grass and leaves which he plucked. Next day he applied to the magistrates, and urged them to have the spot in question dug up. There were found there some bones attached to and intermingled with fetters. The body to which they had belonged, rotted away by time and soil, had abandoned them thus naked and corroded to the chains. They were collected and interred at the public expense, and the house was ever afterwards free from the spirit, which had obtained due sepulture. The above story I believe on the strength of those who affirm it. What follows, I am myself in a position to affirm to others. I have a freedman, who is not without some knowledge of letters. A younger brother of his was sleeping with him in the same bed. The latter dreamed he saw some one sitting on the couch, who approached a pair of scissors to his head, and even cut the hair from the crown of it. When day dawned, he was found to be cropped round the crown, and his locks were discovered lying about. A very short time afterwards, a fresh occurrence of the same kind confirmed the truth of the former one. A lad of mine was sleeping, in company with several others, in the page's apartment. There came through the windows, so he tells the story, two figures in white tunics, who cut his hair as he lay, and departed the way they came. In his case, too, daylight exhibited him shorn, and his locks scattered around. Nothing remarkable followed, except, perhaps this, that I was not brought under accusation as I should have been, if Domitian, in whose reign these events happened, had lived longer. For in his desk was found an information against me which had been presented by Carus, from which circumstance it may be conjectured, inasmuch as it is the custom of accused persons to let their hair grow, that the cutting off of my slave's hair was a sign of the danger which threatened me being averted. I beg, then, that you will apply your great learning to this subject. The matter is one which deserves long and deep consideration on your part, nor am I, for my part, undeserving of having the fruits of your wisdom imparted to me. You may even argue on both sides, as your way is, provided you argue more forcibly on one side than the other, so as not to dismiss me in suspense and anxiety, when the very cause of my consulting you has been to have my doubts put an end to. End of Letter to Sura by Pliny the Younger The Mystery of the Semi-Detached by E. Nesbitt Recorded by Adrian Pretzelis. He was waiting for her. He had been waiting an hour and a half in a dusty suburban lane, with a row of big elms on one side and some eligible building sites on the other, and far away to the southwest, the twinkling yellow lights of the Crystal Palace. It was not quite like a country lane, for it had a pavement and lamp posts, but it was not a bad place for a meeting all the same and farther up toward the cemetery it was really quite rural, and almost pretty, especially in twilight. But twilight had long deepened into the night, and still he waited. He loved her, and he was engaged to be married to her, with the complete disapproval of every reasonable person who had been consulted, and this half-clandestine meeting was tonight to take the place of the grudgingly sanctioned weekly interview, because a certain rich uncle was visiting at her house, and her mother was not the woman to acknowledge to a moneyed uncle, who might go off any day, a match so deeply ineligible 
as hers with him. So he waited for her, and the chill of an unusually severe May evening entered into his bones. The policeman passed him with a surly response to his good night. The bicyclists went by him like grey ghosts with fog horns, and it was nearly ten o'clock, and she had not come. He shrugged his shoulders and turned toward his lodgings. His road led him by her house, desirable, commodious, semi-detached, and he walked slowly as he neared it. She might even now be coming out, but she was not. There was no sign of movement about the house, no sign of life, no lights even in the windows, and her people were not early people. He paused by the gate, wondering. Then he noticed that the front door was open, wide open, and the street lamp shone a little way into the dark hall. There was something about all this that did not please him, that scared him a little indeed. The house had a gloomy and deserted air. It was obviously impossible that it harboured a rich uncle. The old man must have left early, in which case... He walked up the path of patent glazed tiles and listened. No sign of life. He passed into the hall. There was no light anywhere. Where was everybody and why was the front door open? There was no one in the drawing room, and the dining room and the study, nine feet by seven, were equally blank. Everybody was out, evidently, but the unpleasant sense that he was perhaps not the first casual visitor to walk through that open door impelled him to look through the house before he went away and close it after him. So he went upstairs, and at the door of the first bedroom he came to, he struck a wax match, as he had done in the sitting rooms. Even as he did so, he felt that he was not alone. And he was prepared to see something, but for what he saw he was not prepared. For what he saw lay on the bed, in a white, loose gown, and it was his sweetheart and its throat was cut from ear to ear. He doesn't know what happened then, nor how he got downstairs and into the street, but he got out somehow, and the policeman found him in a fit under the lamp post at the corner of the street. He couldn't speak when they picked him up, and he passed the night in the police cells, because the policeman had seen plenty of drunken men before, but never one in a fit. The next morning he was better, though still very white and shaky, but the tale he told the magistrate was convincing, and they sent a couple of constables with him to her house. There was no crowd about it, as he fancied there would be, and the blinds were not down. As he stood, dazed, in front of the front door, it opened, and she came out. He held onto the doorpost for support. "'She's all right, you see,' said the constable, who had found him under the lamp. "'I told you you was drunk, but you would know best.' When he was alone with her, he told her not all, for that would not bear telling, but how he had come into the commodious semi-detached, and how he had found the door open and the lights out, and that he had been into that long back room facing the stairs, and had seen something— in even trying to hint at which he turned sick and broke down, and had to have brandy given him. "'But, my dearest,' she said, "'I dare say the house was dark, for we were all at the Crystal Palace with my uncle, and no doubt the door was open, for the maids will run out if they're left. But you could not have been in that room, because I locked it when I came away, and the key was in my pocket. I dressed in a hurry.' and left all my odds and ends lying about. I know, he said, I saw a green scarf on a chair, and some long brown gloves, and a lot of hairpins and ribbons and a prayer book, and a lace handkerchief on the dressing table. Why, I even noticed the almanac on the mantelpiece. 21 October. At least, it couldn't be that, because this is May, and yet it was. Your almanac is at 21 October, isn't it? 
No, of course it isn't, she said, smiling rather anxiously. But all the other things were just as you say. You must have had a, a dream or a vision or something. He was a very ordinary, commonplace, city young man, and he didn't believe in visions. But he never rested day or night till he got his sweetheart and her mother away from that commodious semi-detached, and settled them in a quiet, distant suburb. In the course of the removal he incidentally married her, and the mother went on living with them. His nerves must have been a good bit shaken, because he was very queer for a long time, and was always inquiring if any one had taken the desirable semi-detached. And when an old stockbroker with a family took it, he went the length of calling on the old gentleman and imploring him by all that he held dear not to live in that fatal house. Why? said the stockbroker, not unnaturally. And then he got so vague and confused, trying to tell why and trying not to tell why, that the stockbroker showed him out and thanked his God that he was not such a fool as to allow a lunatic to stand in the way of his taking that remarkably cheap and desirable semi-detached residence. Now the curious and quite inexplicable part of this story is that when she came down to breakfast on the morning of the 22nd of October, she found him looking like death, with the morning paper in his hand. He caught hers. He couldn't speak, and pointed to the paper. And there she read that on the night of the 21st, a young lady, the stockbroker's daughter, had been found with her throat cut from ear to ear on the bed in the long back bedroom facing the stairs of that desirable semi-detached. End of The Mystery of the Semi-Detached by E. Nesbitt The Hidden Beast by J.D. Beresford His house is the last in the village. Towards the forest, the houses become more and more scattered, reaching out to the wild of the wood, as if they yearn to separate themselves from the swarm that clusters about the church and the inn. And his house has taken so long a stride from the others that it is held to the village by no more than the slender thread of a long footpath. Yet the house is set with its face towards us, and has an air of resolutely holding on to the safety of our common life. As if dismayed at its boldness in swimming so far, it had turned and desperately grasped the lifeline of that footpath. He lived alone, a strange man, surly and reticent. Some said he had a sinister look, and on those rare occasions when he joined us at the inn, after sunset, he sat aside and spoke little. I was surprised when, as we came out of the inn one night, he took my arm and asked me if I would go home with him. The moon was at the full, and the black shadows of the dispersing crowd that lunged down the street seemed to gesticulate an alarm of weird dismay. The village was momentarily mad with the clatter of footsteps and the noise of laughter, and somewhere down towards the forest a dog was baying. I wondered if I had not misunderstood him. As he watched my hesitation, his face pleaded with me. There are times when a man is glad of company, he said. We spoke little as we passed through the village toward the silences of his lonely house, but when we came to the footpath he stopped and looked back. I live between two worlds, he said. The wild and... He paused before he rejected the obvious antithesis, and concluded, The restrained. Are we so restrained, I asked, staring at the huddle of black and silver houses clinging to the refuge on the hill. He murmured something about a compact, and my thoughts turned to the symbol of the chalk-white church tower that dominated the honeycomb of the village. The compact of public opinion, he said more boldly. My imagination lagged. I was thinking less of him than of the transfiguration of the familiar scene before me. I did not remember ever to have studied it thus under the reflections of a full moon. An echo of his word, differently accented, drifted through my mind. I saw our life as being in truth compact, little and limited. 
He took up his theme again when we had entered the house and were facing each other across the table, in a room that looked out over the forest. The shutters were unfastened, the window open, and I could see how on the further shore of the wastelands the light feebly ebbed and died against the black cliff of the wood. We have to choose between freedom and safety, he said. The individual is too wild and dangerous for the common life. He must make his agreement with the community, submit to become a member of the people's body. But I... He paused and laughed. I have taken the liberty of looking out of the back window. While he spoke, I had been aware of a sound that seemed to come from below the floor of the room in which we were sitting. And when he laughed, I fancied that I had heard the response of a snuffling cry. He looked at me mockingly across the table. It's an echo from the jungle, he said. Some trick of reflected sound. I can always hear it in this room at night. I shivered and stood up. I prefer the safety of our common life, I told him. It may be that I have a limited mind and am afraid, but I find my happiness in the joys of security and shelter. The wild terrifies me. A limited mind, he commented. Probably it is rather that you lack a fire in the blood. I was glad to leave him, and he, on his part, made no effort to detain me. It was not long after this visit of mine that the people first began to whisper about him in the village. At the beginning they brought no charge against him, talking only of his strangeness and of his separation from our common interests. But presently I heard a story of some fierce wild animal that he caged and tortured in the prison of his house. One said that he had heard it screaming in the night, and another that he had heard it beating against the door. And some argued that it was a threat to our safety, since the beast might escape and make its way into the village. And some that such brutality, even though it were to a wild animal, could not be tolerated. But I wondered inwardly whether the affair were any business of ours, so long as he kept the beast to himself. I was a member of the council that year, and so took part in the voting when presently the case was laid before us. But no vote of mine would have helped him if I had dared to overcome my reluctance and speak in his favor. For whatever reservations may have been secretly withheld by the members of the council, they were unanimous in condemning him. We went, six of us, in full daylight to search his house. He received us with a laugh and told us that we might seek at our leisure. But though we sought high and low, peering and tapping, we found no evidence that any wild thing had ever been concealed there. And within a month of the day of our search, he left the village. I saw him alone once before he went, and he told me that he had chosen for the wild and freedom, that he could no longer endure to be held to the village even by the thread of the footpath. But he did not thank me for having allowed the search of his house to be conducted by daylight, although he knew that I at least was sure no echo of the forest could be heard in that little room of his, save in the transfigured hours between the dusk and the dawn. End of The Hidden Beast by J.D. Beresford Death and the Woman by Gertrude Atherton Her husband was dying, and she was alone with him. Nothing could exceed the desolation of her surroundings. She and the man who was going from her were in the third floor back of a New York boarding house. It was summer, and the other boarders were in the country. All the servants except the cook had been dismissed, and she, when not working, slept profoundly on the fifth floor. The landlady also was out of town on a brief holiday. The window was open to admit the thick, unstirring air. No sound rose from the row of long, narrow yards, nor from the tall, deep houses annexed. The latter deadened the rattle of the streets. At intervals, the distant elevated lumbered protestingly along, its grunts and screams muffled by the hot, suspended ocean. She sat there plunged in the profoundest grief that can come to the human soul. For in all other agony, hope flickers, however forlornly. She gazed dully at the unconscious breathing form of the man who had been friend and companion and lover during five years of youth too vigorous and hopeful to be warped by uneven fortune. It was wasted by disease. The face was shrunken. The night garment hung loosely about a body which had never been disfigured by flesh, but had been muscular with exercise and full-bodied with health. She was glad that the body was changed, glad that its beauty, too, had gone some other where than into the coffin. 
She had loved his hands as apart from himself, loved their strong, warm magnetism. They lay limp and yellow on the quilt. She knew that they were already cold and that moisture was gathering on them. For a moment, something convulsed within her. They had gone too. She repeated the words twice and after them forever. And the while, the sweetness of their pressure came back to her. She leaned suddenly over him. He was in there still, somewhere. Where? If he had not ceased to breathe, the ego, the soul, the personality was still in the sodden clay which had shaped to give it speech. Why could it not manifest itself to her? Was it still conscious in there, unable to project itself through the disintegrating matter, which was the only medium its creator had vouchsafed it? Did it struggle there, seeing her agony, sharing it, longing for the complete disintegration which should put an end to its torment? She called his name. She even shook him slightly, mad to tear the body apart and find her mate, yet even in that tortured moment realizing that violence would hasten his going. The dying man took no notice of her, and she opened his gown and put her cheek to his heart, calling him again. There had never been more perfect union. How could the bond be so strong if he were not at the other end of it? He was there, her other part. Until dead, he must be living. There was no immediate state. Why should he be as entombed and unresponding as if the screws were in the lid? But the faintly beating heart did not quicken beneath her lips. She extended her arms suddenly, describing eccentric lines above, about him, rapidly open and closing her hands as if to clutch some escaping object, then sprang to her feet and went to the window. She feared insanity. She had asked to be left alone with her dying husband, and she did not wish to lose her reason and shriek a crowd of people about her. The green plots in the yard were not apparent, she noticed. Something heavy like a pall rested upon them. She understood that the day was over and the night was coming. She returned swiftly to the bedside, wondering if she had remained away hours or seconds, and if he were dead. His face was still discernible, and death had not relaxed it. She laid her own against it, then withdrew it with a shuddering flesh, her teeth smiting each other as if an icy wind had passed. She let herself fall back in the chair clasping her hands against her heart, watching with expanding eyes the white sculptured face which, in the glittering dark, was becoming less defined of outline. Did she light the gas, it would draw mosquitoes, and she could not shut from him the little air he was mechanically grateful for, and she did not want to see the opening eye, the falling jaw. Her vision became so fixed that at length she saw nothing, and closed her eyes and waited for the moisture to rise and relieve the strain. When she opened them, his face had disappeared, the humid waves above the housetops put out even the light of the stars, and night was come. Fearfully, she approached her ear to his lips. He still breathed. She made a motion to kiss him, then threw herself back in a quiver of agony. They were not the lips she had known, and she would have nothing less. His breathing was so faint that in her half-reclining position she could not hear it, could not be aware of the moment of his death. She extended her arm resolutely and laid her hand on his heart. Not only must she feel his going, but so strong had been the comradeship between them, it was a matter of loving honor to stand by him to the last. She sat there in the hot, heavy night, pressing her hand hard against the ebbing heart of the unseen and awaited death. Suddenly an odd fancy possessed her. Where was death? Why was he tarrying? Who was detaining him? From what quarter would he come? He was taking his leisure, drawing near with footsteps as measured as those of men keeping time to a funeral march. By a wayward deflection, she thought of the slow music that was always turned on in the theater when the heroine was about to appear or something uneventful to happen. She had always thought this sort of thing ridiculous and inartistic. So had he. She drew her brows together angrily, wondering at her levity, and pressed her relaxed palm against the heart it kept guard over. For a moment the sweat stood on her face, then the pent-up breath burst from her lungs. He still lived. Once more the fancy wantoned above the stunned heart death. Where was he? What a curious experience, to be sitting alone in a big house. She knew that the cook had stolen out, waiting for death to come and snatch her husband from her. No, he would not snatch. He would steal upon his prey, as noiselessly as the approach of sin to innocence, an invisible, unfair, sneaking enemy with whom no man's strength could grapple. If he would only come like a man and take his chances like a man, women had been known to reach the hearts of giants with a dagger's point, but he would creep upon her. She gave an exclamation of horror. Something was creeping over the windowsill. Her limbs palsied, but she struggled to her feet and looked back, her eyes dragged about against her own volition. 
two small green stars glared menacingly at her just above the sill. Then the cat possessing them leaped downward and the stars disappeared. She realized she was horribly frightened. Is this possible? She thought. Am I afraid of death and of death that has not yet come? I have always been a rather brave woman. He used to call me heroic. But then with him it was impossible to fear anything. And I begged them to leave me alone with him as the last of earthly booms. Oh, shame! But she was still quaking as she resumed her seat and laid her hand again on his heart. She wished that she had asked Mary to sit outside the door. There was no bell in the room. To call would be worse than desecrating the house of God. And she would not leave him for one moment to return and find him dead, gone, alone. Her knees smote each other. It was idle to deny it. She was in a state of unreasoning terror. Her eyes rolled apprehensively about. She wondered if she should see it when it came, wondered how far off it was now, not very far. The heart was barely pulsing. She had heard of the power of the corpse to drive brave men to frenzy and had wondered, having no morbid horror of the dead. But this, to wait and wait and wait, perhaps for hours past the midnight, on to the small hours, while that awful, determined, leisurely something stole nearer and nearer. She bent to him who had been her protector with a spasm of anger. Where was the indomitable spirit that had held her all these years with such strong and loving clasp? How could he leave her? How could he desert her? Her head fell back and moved restlessly against the cushion. Moaning with the agony of loss, she recalled him as he had been. Then fear once more took possession of her. She sat erect, rigid, breathless, awaiting the approach of death. Suddenly, far down in the house on the first floor, her strained hearing took note of a sound, a wary, muffled sound, as if someone were creeping up the stair, fearful of being heard. Slowly, it seemed to count a hundred between laying down each foot. She gave a hysterical gasp. Where was the slow music? Her face, her body were wet, as if a wave of death sweat had broken over them. There was a stiff feeling at the roots of her hair. She wondered if it was really standing erect. But she could not raise her hand to ascertain. Possibly it was only the coloring matter freezing and bleaching. Her muscles were flabby. Her nerves twitched helplessly. She knew that it was death who was coming for her through the silent, deserted house. Knew that it was the sensitive ear of her intelligence that heard him, not the dull, coarse-grained ear of the body. He toiled up the stair painfully, as if he were old and tired with much work. But how could he afford to loiter with all the work he had to do? Every minute, every second, he must be in demand to hook his cold, hard finger about a soul struggling to escape from its putrefying tenement. But probably he had his emissaries, his minions, for only those worthy of the honor did he come in person. He reached the first landing and crept like a cat down the hall to the next stair, then crawled slowly up as before. Light as the footfalls were, they were squarely planted, unfaltering, slow. They never halted. Mechanically, she pressed her jerking hand closer against the heart. Its beats were almost done. They would finish, she calculated, just as those footfalls paused beside the bed. She was no longer a human being. She was an intelligence and an ear. Not a sound came from without. Even the elevated appeared to be temporarily off-duty. But inside the big, quiet house, that footfall was waxing louder, louder, until iron feet crashed on iron stairs and echo thundered. She had counted the steps, one, two, three, irritated beyond endurance at the long, deliberate pauses between. As they climbed and clanged with slow precision, she continued to count, audibly and with equal precision, noting their hollow reverberation. How many steps had the stair? She wished she knew. No need. The colossal trampling announced the lessening distance in an increasing volume of sound not to be misunderstood. It turned the curve, it reached the landing, it advanced slowly down the hall, it paused before her door. Then knuckles of iron shook the frail panels, her nerveless tongue gave no invitation. The knocking became more imperious, the very walls vibrated, the handle turned swiftly and firmly with wild instinctive movement, she flung herself into the arms of her husband. When Mary opened the door and entered the room, she found a dead woman lying across a dead man. The End of Death and the Woman A Strange Court Field by Guy Boothby Of course, nine out of every ten intelligent persons will refuse to believe that there could be a grain of truth in the story I am now going to tell you. The Tenth may have some small faith in my veracity, but what I think of his intelligence I am going to keep to myself. 
In a certain portion of a certain Australian colony, two miners were now prospecting in what was then as now one of the dreariest parts of the island continent chanced upon a rich find. They applied to government for the usual reward and in less than a month 3,000 people were settled on the field. What privations they had to go through to get there and the miseries they had to endure when they did reach their journey's end have only a remote bearing on this story, but they would make a big book. I should explain that between Railcat and the field was a stretch of country some 300 miles in extent. It was badly watered, vilely grassed and execrably timbered. What was even worse, a considerable portion of it was made up of red sand, and everybody who has been compelled to travel over that knows what it means. Yet these enthusiastic seekers after wealth pushed on, some on a horseback, some in bullock wagons, but the majority travelled on foot, the graves and the skeleton of cattle belonging to those who had preceded them punctuating the route and telling them what they might expect as they advanced. That the field did not prove a success is now a matter of history. That same history, if you read between the lines, gives one some notion of what the life must have been like while it lasted. The water supply was entirely insufficient. Provisions were bad and ruinously expensive. The men themselves, as a rule, were the roughest of the rough. While the less said about the majority of the women, the better. Then typhoid stepped in and stalked like the destroying angel through the camp. Its inhabitants went down like sheep in a draught, and for most part rose no more. Where there had been a lust of gold, there was now panic, terror. Every man feared that he might be the next to be attacked, and it was only the knowledge of those terrible 300 miles that separated them from civilization that kept many of them on the field. The most thickly populated part was now the cemetery. Drink was the only solace, and under its influence such scenes were enacted as I dare not describe. As they heard of fresh deaths, men shook their fists at heaven and cursed the day when they first saw pick a shovel. Some, bolder than the rest, cleared out just as they stood. A few eventually reached civilization, others perished in the desert. At last, the field was declared abandoned, and the dead were left to take their last long sleep undisturbed by the clank of windlass or the blow of pick. It would take too long to tell all the different reasons that combined to draw me out into that most distressful country. Did it suffice that our party consisted of a young Englishman named Spicer, a wily old Australian bushman named Matthews and myself? We were better off than the unfortunate miners, inasmuch as we were travelling with camels, and our outfits was as perfect as money and experience could make them. The man who travels in any other fashion in the country is neither more nor less than a madman. For a month past, we have been having a fairly rough time of it, and were then on our way south when we had reason to believe rain had fallen, and in consequence grass was plentiful. It was towards evening when we came out of a gully in the ranges and had our first view of the deserted camp. We had no idea of its existence, and for this reason we pulled up our animals and stared at it in complete surprise. Then we pushed on again, wondering what on earth place we had chanced upon. This is all right, said Spicer with a chuckle. We're in luck. Grog shanties and stores, a bath, and perhaps girls. I shook my head. I can't make it out. What's it doing out here? Matthews was looking at it under his hand, and as I knew that he had been out in this direction on a previous occasion, I asked his opinion. It beats me, he replied. But if you ask me what I think, I should say it's Garunia, the field that was deserted some four or five years back. Look here, cried Spicer, who was riding a bit on our left. What are all these things? Graves, as I'm a living man. Here, let's get out of this. There are hundreds of them, and before I know where I am, old Polyphemus here will be on his nose. What he said was correct. The ground over which we were riding was literally bestrewn with graves, some of which had rough, tumble-down headboards, other being destitute of old adornment. We turned away and moved on over safer ground in the direction of the field itself. Such a pitiful sight I never want to see again. The tents and huts and numerous cases were still standing, while the claims gaped at us on every side like new-made graves. A bullock dray, weather worn but still in excellent condition, stood in the main street outside a grog shanty whose signboard, strange incongruity, bore the name of the Killarney Hotel. 
Nothing would suit Spicer but that he must dismount and go in to explore. He was not long away, and when he returned it was with a face as white as a sheet of paper. You never saw such a place, he almost whispered. All I want to do is to get out of it. There's a skeleton on the floor in the back room with an empty rum bottle alongside it. He mounted, and when his beast was on its feet once more, we went on our way. None of us was sorry when we had left the last claim behind us. Half a mile and fifty from the field, the country begins to rise again. There's also a curious cliff away to the left, and as it looked like being a likely place to find water, we were resolved to camp there. We were within a hundred yards or so of this cliff when an exclamation from Spicer attracted my attention. Look, he cried, what's that? I followed the direction in which he was pointing, and to my surprise saw the figure of a man running as if for his life among the rocks. I have said the figure of a man, but as a matter of fact, had there been baboons in the Australian bush, I should have been inclined to have taken him for one. This is a day of surprises, I said. Who can the fellow be, and what makes him act like that? We still continued to watch him as he proceeded on his erratic course along the base of the cliff. Then he suddenly disappeared. Let's get on to camp, I said, and then we'll go after him and endeavour to settle matters a bit. Having selected a place, we off-saddled and prepared our camp. By this time it was nearly dark, and it was very evident that if we wanted to discover the man we had seen, it would be wise not to postpone the search too long. We accordingly strolled off in the direction he had taken, keeping a sharp lookout for any sight of him. Our search, however, was not successful. The fellow had disappeared without leaving a trace of his whereabouts behind him, and yet we were all certain that we had seen him. At length, we returned to our camp for supper, completely mystified. As we ate our meal, we discussed the problem and vowed that on the morrow we would renew the search. Then the full moon rose over the cliff, and the plain immediately became well nigh as bright as day. I had lit my pipe and was stretching myself out upon my blankets, when something induced me to look across at a big rock some half dozen paces from the fire. Peering round it, and evidently taking an absorbing interest in our doings, was the most extraordinary figure I have ever beheld. Shouting something to my companions, I sprang to my feet and dashed across at him. He saw me and fled. Old as he apparently was, he could run like a jackrabbit, and though I have the reputation of being fairly quick on my feet, I found that I had all my work cut out to catch him. Indeed, I am rather doubtful as to whether I should have done so at all, had he not tripped and measured his legs on the ground. Before he could get up, I was on him. I've got you at last, my friend, I said. Now you just come along back to the camp and let us have a look at you. In reply, he snarled like a dog and I believe would have bitten me had I not held him off. My word, he was a creature more animal than man, and the reek of him was worse than that of our camels. From what I could tell, he must have been about sixty years of age, was below the middle height, had white eyebrows, white hair and a white beard. He was dressed partly in rags and partly in skins, and went barefooted like a black fellow. While I was overhauling him, the others came up, whereupon we escorted him back to the camp. Oh, what wooden bottom gift for him, said Spicer. You're a beauty, my friend, and no mistake. What's your name? The fellow only grunted in reply. Then, seeing the pipes in our mouths, a curious change came over him, and he muttered something that resembled, Give me. Want a smoke? interrupted Matthews. Poor beggar's been without for a long time, I reckon. Well, I've got an old pipe, so you can have a draw. He procured one from his back saddle, filled it, and handed it to the man who snatched it greedily and began to puff away at it. How long have you been out here? I asked, when he had squatted himself down alongside the fire. Don't know, he answered this time plainly enough. Can't you get back? continued Matthews, who knew the nature of the country on the other side. Don't want to, was the other's laconic reply. Stay here. I heard Spicer mutter, Mad, mad as a march hare. We then tried to get out of him where he hailed from, but he had either forgotten or didn't understand. Next, we inquired how he managed to live. To this, he answered readily enough, Connie's. Now the carny is a lizard of the iguana type, and eaten raw would be by no means an appetizing dish. Then came the question that gives me my reason for telling this story. It was Paisa who put it. 
You must have a lonely time of it out here, said the latter. How do you manage for company? There is the field, he said. As sociable a field as you'd find. But the field's deserted, man, they put in, and has been for years. The old fellow shook his head. As sociable a field as you ever saw, he repeated. There's Sailor Dick and Frisco, Dick Johnson, Cockney Jim, and half a hundred of them. They're taking it out power for rich on the Golden South, so I heard when I was down at the Canani a while back. It was plain to us all that the old man was, as Spicer had said, as mad as a hatter. For some minutes he rumbled on about the field, talking rationally enough, I must confess, that is to say it would have seemed rational enough if we hadn't known the true facts of the case. At last he got on to his feet, saying, Well, I must be going. They'll be expecting me. It's my shift on with Cockney Jim. But you don't work at night, growled Matthews from the other side of the fire. We work always, the other replied. If you don't believe me, come and see for yourselves. I wouldn't go back to that place for anything, said Spicer. But I must confess that my curiosity had been aroused, and I determined to go, if only to see what this strange creature did when we got there. Matthew decided to accompany me, and not wishing to be left alone, Spicer at length agreed to do the same. Without looking round, the old fellow led the way across the plain towards the field. Of all the nocturnal excursions I've made in my life, that was certainly the most uncanny. Not once did our guide turn his head, but pushed on at a pace that gave us some trouble to keep up with him. It was only when we came to the first claim that he paused. Listen, he said, and you can hear the camp at work, then you'll believe me. We did listen, and as I live, we could distinctly hear the rustling of sluice boxes and cradles, the groaning of windlasses. In fact, the noise you hear on a goldfield at the busiest hour of the day. We moved a little closer, and believe me or not, I swear to you I could see, I thought I could see, the shadowy forms of men moving about in that ghostly moonlight. Meanwhile, the wind sighed across the plain, flapping what remained of the old tents, and giving an additional touch of horror to the general desolation. I could hear Spicer's teeth chattering behind me, and for my own part I felt as if my blood were turning to ice. That's the claim, the Golden South away to the right there, said the old man, and if you will come along with me I'll introduce you to my mates. But this was an honour we declined in without hesitation. I wouldn't have gone any further among those tents for the wealth of all the Indies. I've had enough of this, said Spicer and I can tell you I hardly recognise his voice. Let's get back to camp. By this time our guide had left us and was making his way in the direction he had indicated. We could plainly hear him addressing imaginary people as we marched along. As for ourselves, we turned about and hurried back to our camp as fast as we could go. Once there, the grog bottle was produced and never did three men stand more in need of stimulants. Then we set to work to find some explanation of what we had seen or had fancied we saw, but it was impossible. The wind might have rattled the old windlasses, but it could not be held accountable for those shadowy grey forms that had moved about among the claims. I give it up, said Spicer at last. I know that I never want to see it again. What's more, I vote that we clear out of here tomorrow morning. We all agreed and then retired to our blankets, but for my part I do not mind confessing I scarcely slept a wink all night. The thought that that hideous old man might be hanging about the camp would alone be sufficient for that. Next morning, as soon as it was light, we breakfasted, but before we broke camp, Matthews and I set off along the cliff in an attempt to discover our acquaintance of the previous evening. Though, however, we searched high and low for reports of an hour. No success rewarded us. By mutual consent, we resolved not to look for him on a field. When we returned to Spicer, we placed such tobacco and stores as we could spare under the shadow of the big rock, where the mystery would be likely to see them, then mounted our camels and resumed our journey, heartily glad to be on our way once more. Garunia Goldfield is a place I never desire to visit again. I don't like its population. End of A Strange Goldfield The Strange Orchid by H. G. Wells The buying of orchids always has in it a certain speculative flavor. You have before you the brown, shriveled lump of tissue, 
and for the rest you must trust your judgment, or the auctioneer, or your good luck as your taste may incline. The plant may be moribund or dead, or it may be just a respectable purchase. Fair value for your money, or perhaps, for the thing has happened again and again, there slowly unfolds before the delighted eyes of the happy purchaser, day after day, some new variety, some novel richness, a strange twist of the labellum, or some subtler coloration or unexpected mimicry. Pride, beauty, and profit blossom together on one delicate green spike, and, it may be, even immortality. For the new miracle of nature may stand in need of a new specific name, and what so convenient as that of its discoverer? John Smithia! There have been worse names. It was perhaps the hope of some such happy discovery that made Winter Wedderburn such a frequent attendant at these sales. That hope, and also, maybe, the fact that he had nothing else of the slightest interest to do in the world. He was a shy, lonely, rather ineffectual man, provided with just enough income to keep off the spur of necessity and not enough nervous energy to make him seek any exacting employments. He might have collected stamps or coins, or translated Horace or bound books, or invented new species of diatoms, but, as it happened, he grew orchids, and had one ambitious little hothouse. I have a fancy, he said over his coffee, that something is going to happen to me today. He spoke, as he moved and thought, slowly. Oh, don't say that, said his housekeeper, who was also his remote cousin, for something happening was a euphemism that meant only one thing to her. You misunderstand me. I mean nothing unpleasant, though what I do mean I scarcely know. Today, he continued after a pause, Peters is going to sell a bunch of plants from the Andamans and the Indies. I shall go up and see what they have. It may be I shall buy something good, unawares. That may be it. He passed his cup for his second cupful of coffee. Are these the things collected by that poor young fellow you told me of the other day? asked his cousin as she filled his cup. Yes, he said, and became meditative over a piece of toast. Nothing ever does happen to me, he remarked presently, beginning to think aloud. I wonder why. Things enough happen to other people. There is Harvey. Only the other week, on Monday, he picked up sixpence. On Wednesday, his chicks all had the staggers. On Friday, his cousin came home from Australia. And on Saturday, he broke his ankle. What a whirl of excitement, compared to me. I think I would rather be without so much excitement, said his housekeeper. It can't be good for you. I suppose it's troublesome. Still, you see, nothing ever happens to me. When I was a little boy, I never had accidents. I never fell in love as I grew up never married. I wonder how it feels to have something happen to you. Something really remarkable. That orchid collector was only 36, 20 years younger than myself when he died, and he had been married twice and divorced once. He had had malarial fever four times, and once he broke his thigh. He killed a melee once, and once he was wounded by a poisoned dart. And in the end, he was killed by jungle leeches. It must have all been very troublesome, but then it must have been very interesting, you know. Except, perhaps, the leeches. I am sure it was not good for him, said the lady with conviction. Perhaps not. And then Wedderburn looked at his watch. Twenty-three minutes past eight. I am going up by the quarter to twelve train. So that there is plenty of time, I think I shall wear my alpaca jacket. It is quite warm enough, and my gray felt hat, and brown shoes. I suppose, he glanced out of the window at the serene sky and sunlit garden, and then nervously at his cousin's face, 
I think you had better take an umbrella if you're going to London, she said in a voice that admitted of no denial. There's all between here and the station coming back. When he returned, he was in a state of mild excitement. He had made a purchase. It was rare that he could make up his mind quickly enough to buy, but this time he had done so. There are Vandas, he said, and a dendrobe and some paleonophis. He surveyed his purchases lovingly as he consumed his soup. They were laid out on the spotless tablecloth before him, and he was telling his cousin all about them as he slowly meandered through his dinner. It was his custom to live all his visits to London over again in the evening for her and his own entertainment. I knew something would happen today. I have bought all these, some of them, some of them, I feel sure, do you know, that some of them will be remarkable. I don't know how it is, but I feel just as sure as if someone had told me that some of these will turn out remarkable. That one, he pointed to a shriveled rhizome, was not identified. It may be a paleonophis, or it may not. It may be a new species, or even a new genus. And it was the last that poor Batten ever collected. I don't like the look of it, said his housekeeper. It's such an ugly shape. To me, it scarcely seems to have a shape. I don't like those things that stick out, said his housekeeper. It shall be put away in a pot tomorrow. It looks, said the housekeeper, like a spider shamming dead. Wedderburn smiled and surveyed the root with his head on one side. It is certainly not a pretty lump of stuff, but you can never judge of these things from their dry appearance. It may turn out to be a very beautiful orchid indeed. How busy I shall be tomorrow. I must see tonight just exactly what to do with these things, and tomorrow I shall set to work. They found poor Batten lying dead or dying in a mangrove swamp, I forget which, he began again presently, with one of these very orchids crushed up under his body. He had been unwell for some days with some kind of native fever, and I suppose he fainted. These mangrove swamps are very unwholesome. Every drop of blood, they say, was taken out of him by the jungle leeches. It may be that very plant that cost his life to obtain. I think none the better of it for that. Men must work, though women may weep, said Wedderburn, with profound gravity. Fancy dying away from every comfort in a nasty swamp. Fancy being ill of fever with nothing to take but chlorodyne and quinine. If men were left to themselves, they would live on chlorodyne and quinine. <laughs> no one around you but horrible natives. They say the Andaman Islanders are most disgusting wretches, and anyway, they can scarcely make good nurses, not having the necessary training, and just for people in England to have orchids. I don't suppose it was comfortable, but some men seem to enjoy that kind of thing, said Wedderburn. Anyhow, the natives of his party were sufficiently civilized to take care of all his collection until his colleague, who was an ornithologist, came back again from the interior. Though they could not tell the species of the orchid and had let it wither, and it makes these things more interesting, it makes them disgusting. I should be afraid of some of the malaria clinging to them, and just think, there's been a dead body lying across that ugly thing. I never thought of that before. There, I declare, I cannot eat another mouthful of dinner. I will take them off the table, if you like, and put them in the window seat. I can see them just as well there. The next few days he was indeed singularly busy in the steamy little hothouse, fussing about with charcoal, lumps of teak, moss, and all the other mysteries of the orchid cultivator. He considered he was having a wonderfully eventful time. In the evening he would talk about these new orchids to his friends, and over and over again he reverted to his expectation of something strange. Several of the Vandas and the Dendrobium died under his care, but presently the strange orchid began to show signs of life. He was delighted, and took his housekeeper right away from jam-making to see it at once, directly he made the discovery. That is a bud, he said, and presently there will be a lot of leaves there, and those little things coming out here are 
aerial rootlets. They look to me like little white fingers poking out of the brown. I don't like them, said his housekeeper. Why not? I don't know. They look like fingers trying to get at you. I, I can't help my likes and dislikes. I don't know for certain, but I don't think there are any orchids I know that have aerial rootlets quite like that. It may be my fancy, of course. You see, they are a little flattened at the ends. I don't like them, said his housekeeper, suddenly shivering and turning away. I know it's very silly of me, and I'm... I'm very sorry, particularly as you like the thing so much, but I can't help thinking of that corpse. But it may not be that particular plant. That was merely a guess of mine. His housekeeper shrugged her shoulders. Anyhow, I don't like it, she said. Wedderburn felt a little hurt at her dislike to the plant, but that did not prevent his talking to her about orchids generally, and this orchid in particular, whenever he felt inclined. There are such queer things about orchids, he said one day, such possibilities of surprise. You know, Darwin studied their fertilization and showed that the whole structure of an ordinary orchid flower was contrived in order that moths might carry the pollen from plant to plant. Well, it seems that there are lots of orchids known the flower of which cannot possibly be used for fertilization in that way. Some of the cypripediums, for instance, there are no insects known that can possibly fertilize them, and some of them have never been found with seed. But how do they form new plants? By runners and tubes, and that kind of outgrowth. That is easily explained. The puzzle is, what are the flowers for? Very likely, he added, my orchid may be something extraordinary in that way. If so, I shall study it. I have often thought of making researches as Darwin did, but hitherto I have not found the time or something else has happened to prevent it. The leaves are beginning to unfold now. I do wish you would come and see them. But she said that the orchid house was so hot it gave her the headache. She had seen the plant once again, and the aerial rootlets, which were now some of them more than a foot long, had unfortunately reminded her of tentacles reaching out after something, and they got into her dreams, growing after her with incredible rapidity, so that she had settled to her entire satisfaction that she would not see that plant again, and Wedderburn had to admire its leaves alone. They were of the ordinary broad form, and a deep glossy green, with splashes and dots of deep red toward the base. He knew of no other leaves quite like them, the plant was placed on a low bench near the thermometer, and close by was a simple arrangement by which a tap dripped on the hot water pipes and kept the air steamy. And he spent his afternoons now with some regularity meditating on the approaching flowering of this strange plant. And at last the great thing happened. Directly he entered the little glass house, he knew that the spike had burst out, although his great Paleonophis Lowy had the corner where his new darling stood. There was a new odor in the air, a rich, intensely sweet scent that overpowered every other in that crowded, steaming little greenhouse. Directly he noticed this, he hurried down to the strange orchid. And behold, the trailing green spikes bore now three great splashes of blossom, from which this overpowering sweetness proceeded. He stopped before them in an ecstasy of admiration. The flowers were white, with streaks of golden orange upon the petals. The heavy labellum was coiled into an intricate projection, and a wonderful bluish purple mingled there with the gold. He could see at once that the genus was altogether a new one. And the insufferable scent? How hot the place was! The blossoms swam before his eyes. He would see if the temperature was right. He made a step toward the thermometer. Suddenly, everything appeared unsteady. The bricks on the floor were dancing up and down. Then the white blossoms, the green leaves behind them, the whole greenhouse seemed to sweep sideways, and then in a curve upward. At half-past four, his cousin made the tea 
according to their invariable custom. But Wedderburn did not come in for his tea. He is worshipping that horrid orchid, she told herself, and waited ten minutes. His watch must have stopped. I will go and call him. She went straight to the hothouse, and, opening the door, called his name. There was no reply. She noticed that the air was very close, and loaded with an intense perfume. Then she saw something lying on the bricks, between the hot water pipes. For a minute, perhaps, she stood motionless. He was lying face upward at the foot of the strange orchid. The tentacle-like aerial rootlets no longer swayed freely in the air, but were crowded together. A tangle of gray ropes, and stretched tight with their ends closely applied to his chin and neck and hands. She did not understand. Then she saw, from under one of the exultant tentacles upon his cheek, there trickled a little thread of blood. With an inarticulate cry, she ran towards him and tried to pull him away from the leech-like suckers. She snapped two of these tentacles, and their sap dripped red. Then the overpowering scent of the blossom began to make her head reel. How they clung to him. She tore at the tough ropes, and he and the white inflorescence swam around her. She felt she was fainting, knew she must not. She left him, and hastily opened the nearest door, and, after she had panted for a moment in the fresh air, she had a brilliant inspiration. She caught up a flower pot, and smashed in the windows at the end of the greenhouse. Then she re-entered. She tugged now with renewed strength at Wedderburn's motionless body, and brought the strange orchid crashing to the floor. It still clung with the grimmest tenacity to its victim. In a frenzy, she lugged it and him into the open air. Then she thought of tearing through the sucker rootlets one by one, and in another minute she had released him and was dragging him away from the horror. He was white and bleeding from a dozen circular patches. The odd job man was coming up the garden, amazed at the smashing of glass, and saw her emerge, hauling the inanimate body with red-stained hands. For a moment, he thought impossible things. "'Bring some water!' she cried, and her voice dispelled his fancies. When, with unnatural alacrity, he returned with the water, he found her weeping with excitement and with Wedderburn's head upon her knee, wiping the blood from his face. "'What's, what's the matter?' said Wedderburn opening his eyes feebly and closing them again at once. "'Go and tell Annie to come out here to me, and then go for Dr. Haddon at once,' she said to the odd job man so soon as he had brought the water, and, and added, seeing he hesitated, "'I will tell you all about it when you come back.' Presently Wedderburn opened his eyes again, and seeing that he was troubled by the puzzle of his position, she explained to him, you fainted in the hothouse. And the orchid? I will see to that, she said. Wedderburn had lost a good deal of blood, but beyond that he had suffered no very great injury. They gave him brandy, mixed with some pink extract of meat, and carried him upstairs to bed. His housekeeper told her incredible story in fragments to Dr. Haddon. Come to the orchid house and see, she said. The cold outer air was blowing in through the open door, and the sickly perfume was almost dispelled. Most of the torn aerial rootlets lay already withered amidst a number of dark stains upon the bricks. The stem of the inflorescence was broken by the fall of the plant, and the flowers were growing limp and brown at the edges of the petals. The doctor stooped towards it, then saw that one of the aerial rootlets still stirred feebly, and hesitated. The next morning the strange orchid still lay there, black now and putrescent. The door banged intermittingly in the morning breeze, and all the array of Wedderburn's orchids was shriveled and prostrate. But Wedderburn himself 
was bright and garrulous upstairs in the story of his strange adventure. End of The Strange Orchid by H.G. Wells.